Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. In today's podcast, we're going to talk about steps you should go through when you're automating a program. Hey, everyone. It's Joe Glines out of Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and Jackie here from Copenhagen, Denmark. And, and today, as I said, we're going to kind of get work on an outline of steps you should think about and consider, questions you might want to ask yourself before you automate a program and when you first start. So uh, let's jump into the first one, which is one of the most important ones to kind of identify right away. Who is going to be running the script? Because, man, it changes everything. If it's just you or if, if you're passing along to a colleague at work that has no idea what they're doing, the you know what you put into that script is going to be very different. Yeah, absolutely. Who is running the script? In, in, in almost any cases, right, if, if you're sitting back and putting up download or whatever, you might have a very little chance of knowing who, but in the creation process, having an idea of who is going to use it will help immensely. Absolutely. And, and I'll take the next one here is, will a GUI help, right? especially if you're sharing it with others. A GUI can help if you need to input a lot of different values, but if other people need to do it, when should they do it? Do they need to activate something to input it? Do they need to write to wait to the right moment? A GUI can probably help. Yeah, no doubt. Having if, if the second I consider I'm going to give this to someone, often I'll have a GUI to to let people have options because the last thing I want is for them to go in and edit some code for for most people, right? Um, but yeah, and, and then another really critical one is you know how many computers is it going to run on? Because if it's just running on your computer, the one computer, it's it's much simpler. But the second you say, okay, now there's it's not just one computer. There's a lot, there's some follow-up questions. Let me start on the first one here is, um, are the file paths that you're referencing all going to be in that same location? And do you want to make sure you write them in a way that's relative so so you can structure that? Uh, if it's just running in your computer, you probably don't have to worry about it. Yeah, and, and the next one here, where is, do the computers have the same OS? Because it, it really fits into that. If you're just using standard system files or standard system functionality in whatever you're automating, fair enough, but you still need to know if it's running on the same OS because either you need to make it more uh, backward compatible or uh, stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and then following up with that one is the do the people that, that are going to be running this have the same admin rights? Because, boy, that can really trip you up when you, you think, oh, I, I look, I have access to this, and then you give it to someone and they can't, they can't install things in a certain place or they don't have, they can't elevate it, run it at a certain level and things can just not work. So it's good to know those things. And of course there's workarounds for if they don't have it, right? But it's just, you probably don't want to add all that to your script if you don't need to. Yeah, exactly right. Who will be running your script, right? Is there a GUI? How many computers will run it? And does every user have uh, admin rights? Because if, if they're running it on their home computer, to probably have admin rights, but are they running it in a, a company setting? They probably don't have admin rights. So yeah, knowing who's going to be running it, absolutely critical. Um, then I'd say I'll, I'll jump to the next one, which is uh, uh, write high level pseudo code of what will have to be done in each step. Right. It's not because you need to be sitting in a text editor and writing the pseudocode. You can do it in every place you want, but some people might find it um, a nice reference or scaffolding to their actual script if they've written some pseudocode. I think actually that scaffolding, that's a great way to kind of help people convey what you're doing. You're, it's, it's a very high level. You're just starting off with, it's going to be doing this. And then I'm going to need something that does this and something does this, right? And it's, it just helps you design your code better later when you actually start coding. Uh, you work through a lot of the stuff and understanding, oh, I'm going to need a function that might do this and I need this. And, and it can help you identify certain things beforehand. So you're not rewriting your code when you just get started. Uh, and then onto that also is just understanding the decision-making process of how people are going to be using the script. 
and what they need to think about, right? And it's going to help you understand, do you, do you have a hotkey that launches it? Does it, you know, how does it get launched? Do you have a, a GUI and, and the, the things you're going to have to have available at different points, right? So you got to understand the pro- overall process, and is it really a lot of different processes, which we'll get to here in a second. Yeah, and, and this one is also, uh, it relates to some of those that comes later, but you can choose to have user input at specific points in your script. It doesn't need to always be uh, one point does it all or whatever you call that. But um, I say the next one is break each task down into smaller trun- chunks or parts just because it makes so much sense. It's one of the terms I've heard many times over when when talking about, can a computer really automate that? But if you break it down enough, it can. There's almost like a computer can't think for itself. Okay, but apparently a computer build, uh, beat the best chess player and the best alpha go player in the world and stuff like that. So saying it can't do it is maybe more a thing of it can't do it right now, but it may end up doing it. And it's the same thing with, oh, but it can't automate my task. Mm, we can probably teach it to do most of it at least. No, I, I 100% agree. I'm actually going to tweak what you're saying. I'm going to incorporate in the next step, which is, uh, you know, write pseudocode of each micro step. So instead of just the high level, now under that high level, you have your kind of v- lower level, still writing pseudocode, not actual code. But I wanted to tweak what you were saying is, can the computer do this? And this is what's really cool, right, with AutoHotKey, because people will say, oh, well, I, I wanted to do this, but, you know, I'm not a good enough programmer. When you start breaking it down into smaller and smaller chunks and start thinking through the logic of like, well, what am I going to do? I have to, how am I going to decide to do this? Well, if that image is there or if this happens, oh, okay, I can write that. I know that if coming at like, you know, it's it's not overly complex. When you really start breaking it down to that baby step of decision making, it suddenly becomes clear, right, of what you need to do. Yeah, we've looked at RPA programs and stuff like that before. And when you take the essence of those or bots or whatever it might be, um, if you can do it, if a person can sit there and do it, there's almost a 100% chance that you can make the computer do it as well. It might not do it better or faster in the first round, right? But in the long run, you will, if you give it the right framework or its own workstation or whatever, if you remove enough of the, the uh, hurdles around it, it can do it. And if you break all steps down into micro steps, like move the mouse to here, click the button. If this happens, then that, stuff like that. So absolutely uh, go for that. And I'd say we have the next one here that is consider breaking up your automation into pieces that can be done now, right? For a quick win and then add more over time. Because I think both me and Joe has done it multiple times. We have a task. It might be a lengthy one. There needs to be made, who knows, thousands of entries or whatever it is. And... If you can break down some of those things, make the first 10 things that need to happen a hotkey one, and then you do something. You log into the next window or you pull it forth or whatever it is. And then the next things that are going to happen is on hotkey two, and so on and so forth. Uh, You will still be the one controlling it. It will not be fully automated but the task will get done in a much speedier way. No, that's spot on, Jackie. And, and it's it's amazing how often you can automate some of the, and that's the whole thing, which we need to have a podcast on this, of like what are humans good at and what are you know computers good at? 
and that repeating applying a process computers are amazing at and humans suck at, but that decision-making process of what should I be doing here and there, com- humans are amazing at, and computers obviously need, to, need either a lot of data or a lot of programming to, to solve that, which is why I, I often say, don't worry so much about your logic and decision. Use your brain to, to decide when uh, X, Y, and Z happens and just automate the process itself of executing it. And so when you take that approach, you can often get so much of your tasks done very quickly. And then over time say, you know what? I realized this is the logic that I need to use here in order to, to really kind of skip the human intervention, right? To where I can get the computer to decide instead of me deciding. But because those things can, those can definitely take a lot more time compared to the actual execution of the task. Um, so the next one, now we're getting into now, after you've done all the stuff and you're kind of happy with everything you've worked through, let's start working on this next process. And the first one would be, let's take a look at all the other scripts, you know, at least think about, have I done some of these things before, right? Why reinvent the wheel? Do I already have a script that solves X, Y, and Z part of this? Yeah, and, and I, lo- I love that one. And because we've mostly talked about pseudo code and considering breaking up specific places, making it into these micro scripts or whatever you would call that. Um, after considering uh, actually looking through what you have, some people won't think about it. They will either remember that they had it or whatever, but you could also go and look in other places if someone else has done it. That's also okay. Um, and I'll say there, the next one might be how will you actually automate each program, right? I, I know you have uh, broken up all the steps. You have decided which part will be done by the computer, which part will be done by you. You have a high-level understanding of what you will do in every place. But then actually deciding on which automation you want to use for any given program. And as a, as a new person to programming, you might have learned how to do keystrokes and mouse clicks. Go with that. Um, or if you can't really figure out if this program supports this way or that way, go with image search and mouse moves, whatever it might be that you need to do. But you could also opt it into something new you want to learn. You might want to learn how to control uh, Windows building controls or calm or there's an api on that website or whatever it might be yeah yeah and those are also highly related to how many pro um, computers is this going to run on and the if it's more than one and you know what do they have access to as well because not everyone's going to have necessarily the same things uh, uh, also and actually i'm going to add this one jackie which uh, i don't think it was in the list really at least the summary is Decide up front your level of comfort when there's errors, right? Of like, because some of these things, sending keystrokes, generally speaking, is not nearly as reliable as like using Calm. But there is a steeper learning curve with Calm as opposed to writing, you know, syntax to send keystrokes. Uh, but so it's a trade-off um, depending on, on your familiarity and your expertise. And, and I 100% agree still, if you're not up to programming in Calm, go ahead and automate Excel with sending keystrokes if you have to, right? It, it's okay. It's just it's going to have more errors, right? But again, if you're going to be giving something to 50 people and it's going to be causing more problems, you might want to put more thought into like, I want something very reliable. So I'm not going to rely on image search or sending keystrokes, you know, on that. Yeah. Um, I'll take the next one here as well is, are you using the best source? Can you get the data from somewhere better? Uh, We have talked about this multiple times over. Uh, I've come with different examples. And and one of them that that I love is uh, one time at the company that I'm currently working at, uh, someone came over to me and said, can you convert this PDF into text? And I was like, yeah, I have a few ideas of how we can actually do that. And before we got to the end of it, and before I had used a lot of time on it, I interviewed the guy and asked him why he needed it and stuff like that. And it turned out that him doing a bit of research to figure out where he was getting it, how many steps was it going through before he got it and stuff like that, it already existed as an Excel version 
and then someone had made it into a PDF and sent it into the company. So he was trying to convert something into a lesser version of what already existed. And to that, I would just say, are you using the best source? Or could you just ask someone? That, that it might be all that was actually needed. Ask your IT department, ask the guy who sent you the PDF, or whatever it might be. Yeah, I can't chime in enough on that one. I, I got hired actually by a buddy of mine. Well, he, he asked me to get brought in, and um, and he wanted to automate this process. And he didn't tell me at the time that it was it was actually um, on a on a um, cell phone. It was an app, you know. And anyway, so it was going to be like really complicated. And then I realized there, there, the app, after I did my, my diligence and digging into it, was querying a database that they have access to. You know, that it's their database. And they have a team of people that work with SQL. And I'm like, this is ludicrous for me to be automating an app, you know, in something that I'm not very comfortable in, in the first place when you have access to the database, right? So it was, and, and they, he finally worked it out with his teammate and how to, you know, to, to get them to solve it for him. But yeah, that, that was a big one. Um, obviously, you know, after you've done this, you still, if you don't have an example of it, you know, do some searching. Look at the the forum, Stack Overflow, Reddit, YouTube, um, the Automator. You know, there's a lot of places where I have examples. And um, well, and I'll throw it in there, asking your friends as well. Which Jackie and I, if I'm working in something new and I haven't done before, I'll just ping him real quick and say like, Hey, have you ever done this? And it's usually a quick conversation, but often they can point you in the right direction and save you a crap load of time. Yeah, we recently had with tool tips, right? You you had just gotten a new functionality built into a GUI. It was great and it worked great. And I saw it, I was like, yeah, I, I remember also having built that in. And I had used one method and you had used another method. And not because one of the methods were actually better, they were just different. But the general idea of asking someone you know hopefully you know or on the forums or in the chat or wherever you have some kind of knowing resource go for it yeah and and actually to follow up on that so i i paid hellbent to work on that gui i was describing um, and then after jackie showed me what he used i forwarded it to hellbent just so he knows hey there's a, actually a um a function on the the forum that has built in you know using windows controls tooltips which I don't think he's going to want to use, but again, it's just helping other people be aware of stuff, right? So it, it's always just good to, to if someone's helping you, give you know, if you hear about something new, let them know. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and finish off the last one, which is my favorite? Uh, can I even? I, I I can't see the last one. <laughs> it was to actually start writing code. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't feel that's important. You should just know what the code needs to be, and then that's it. Yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've seen some videos where um, from programmers, and they say, no one really programs anymore. You're, like, connecting things and doing stuff, right? But it, it is kind of funny. It's like, in a lot of ways, people now don't even program. They just connect libraries and kind of, you know, make them work together. But that's funny. Yeah, and it's probably right. Uh, a large majority or I don't know, even know if it's a majority, but at least a large uh, number of people who are automating or programming or making stuff happen programmatically might not be programming. And then you have all the levels of that, right? Do you need to be the guy who tells it if it's a zero or a one to be a programmer? Maybe not. But is it okay if you actually use uh, what your uh, peers or predecessors actually learned and built um, for you to use less time on it, right? You, you don't need to invent the sliced bread each time. Right. If someone has already done it, take a slice and get that sandwich done. Right. It's just awesome. Yeah. Now I, I know, and we'll, we talk a lot about this too. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to learn something new, then, you know, you might want to go ahead and um, I'm not, I still wouldn't say start from scratch. Right. But borrow that other code you have and, and, you know, examine it and play with it, which is, you know, that's, that's the fundamental difference I think between you and I, it's one of the big ones. 
when when we both will search for an example of something and we find it, we'll look at it. You dive really deep into it and learn the ins and outs of it. Me, I'm I'm screw it. I'm on to the next thing, right? I don't. I learn how to. I can use it, but I don't study it. And uh, of course, because I and I haven't become a really great programmer because of it, which I, I'm okay with because I don't like the program, right? But it it just depends on your goals. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, hopefully, I hope that that helps you guys uh, work through thinking about, you know, I know it's it's a lot of kind of questions of things that you might want to cite, but it really does help you avoid some major issues if you don't think about some of these things up front. Yeah, and, and let us get the feedback, right? Do, yep. do you use pseudocode or do you think it's totally foolish or do you actually have some pseudocode in your head? Right, you probably have one or the uh, the other, whoever. Yeah, let us know. Yeah, and and if there's other pro other things that are missing from this list, I'd love to hear it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Yeah. Bye.